Good afternoon. Good afternoon. It is a, a pleasure to uh, welcome those of you who are not from Brown, here at Brown on this very cold, but actually pretty bright afternoon. So thank you for making the trek here. Thank you for taking time out to participate in what we hope will be a lively, engaging, and informative summit uh, on diversity and inclusion. I first of all, as many of you know who plan such events, um, none of this, including the transformation of this Casper multipurpose room, uh, none of this would be possible without the dedicated work of uh, many of our wonderful people here at Brown. And so first of all, a big thank you to my staff in the Office of Institutional Diversity and Inclusion, especially to Margot Soret, Lynn Hernandez, Wendy mccray Away, and Maria Paula Mosquera for their work in planning this uh, over the past year. A special thank you to our events staff, uh, Megan Dupre, Jody Soares, and our student ambassadors. And as well, as you know, our Brown Catering and Dining Services is remarkable, and I want to especially thank George Barboza back there for his work and support uh, for this summit. And then uh, last but not least, certainly our media services and facility staff uh, for doing all the good work that they do every day to keep Brown looking wonderful. So two years ago, in the wake of Brown's 250th celebration, we convened this, the first ever Diversity and Inclusion Summit here in this very space. The keynote speakers then, I, and then a few of you I think were here actually two years ago, um, the keynote speakers then were actually remarkable brown students from diverse backgrounds, a couple of them actually undocumented students, who fearlessly and unapologetically shared their narratives of how they came to be here in this academic community. Since that time, obviously, as we all know, much has changed in our academic landscape, and they change daily, every day in our society. And the work of diversity and inclusion in our institutions have taken on an even more sense of urgency. We are here together at this summit, not just to hear from thought leaders and innovators, but also to individually and collectively fearlessly and unap unapologetically share our own narratives of diversity and inclusion work so that we can learn and labor together to fulfill the kind of inclusive excellence that we aspire to be in a 21st century university in America today. Our work together, as we discussed uh, with our uh, keynote speaker earlier today, requires committed, compassionate, and thoughtful leadership at all levels. Here at Brown, I've been privileged to work with such leaders at the very top, from our president, Christina Paxson, who unfortunately could not be here due to an emergency, and whose commitment to diversity and inclusion has been made evident in numerous ways as she has navigated the challenges and complexities of leading Brown University over the past five years. And to our provost, Richard Locke, who has been so essential in bringing many of our diversity and inclusion action plan initiatives to fruition. His vision of inclusive excellence is one that invites all of us to the table to learn from one another and to contribute to the mission of higher education in a broader way. So to introduce our keynote speaker, please join me in welcoming Brown's Provost, Rick Locke, to the podium. Thank you, Lisa, uh, and good afternoon, everyone. It's really wonderful to see you all in this incredible uh, light. You know, this, it doesn't feel like winter, it's like spring, uh, which is great, and that's how we should uh, think about it. Um, it's really wonderful to be able to uh, be with you today and to offer a couple, uh, uh, some brief remarks uh, as we open uh, Brown's uh, Second Diversity and Inclusion uh, Summit. But before I begin, I want to recognize a true friend of Brown, the president of Tougaloo uh, College, uh, Beverly Hogan. Uh, who's here with us today. It's wonderful to see you. Uh, in opening a partnership with Tougaloo uh, College in 1964 and sustaining this partnership uh, for more than 50 years, uh, Brown has been enriched uh, beyond measure. Uh, and so we're really honored to have you here and thank you for all that you do in terms of teaching us what the right thing is that we should be doing. So thank you. 
Uh, I also want to recognize members of the President's Advisory Council on Diversity, uh, a group of people whose advice continues to be invaluable to President Paxson, to myself, and to the university. And I also want to thank uh, Lisa cariago uh and the Office of Institutional Diversity and Inclusion for their leadership in not just organizing this summit, but for all the work that you do every day on campus. It's really, really uh, terrific. So Brown, as, as Lisa mentioned, uh, recently celebrated its 250th anniversary. Uh, and during that year-long celebration, there was plenty of time uh, for reflection about Brown's many virtues and contributions uh, to society. But there was also an opportunity to reflect on the darker moments of our past, such as the university's ties to the transatlantic slave trade. Now these moments, and I think it's important to reflect on both the dark moments and uh, the optimistic moments, these moments remind us how much more needs to be done at Brown and for Brown so that we can become the truly excellent and inclusive community that we aspire to be. And it's in this context that Brown convened its first National Diversity Summit in March 2015. That summit marked a point of departure for Brown's thinking and goal setting and planning uh, for the various diversity initiatives. And it was through that work that it informed the university's operational plan, Building on Distinction, and later on the university's diversity and inclusion action plan, Pathways. Um, and it was in those two major plans, Building on Distinction and the Pathways to Diversity and Inclusion, that this university has once again affirmed the imperative of diversity as a centerpiece, in fact, as an organizing principle for this university in the future. And I think this is important. Sometimes there's a, a, a false narrative, a dichotomy that, you know, university about academic excellence, oh, and by the way, there's also diversity. That's not the way that we think about it, or anyone should be thinking about it. For us, the pathway to excellence at this university today and in the future is through uh, diversity and inclusion, only by attracting the best and the brightest from all walks of life and also making sure that we are supportive of the people once they're in our community and inclusive of them once they're in our community, can we achieve our academic goals? I have no question that that's true. Now, it's been a year since we launched the Diversity and Inclusion Action Plan. And this was a plan that, as I said, is a cornerstone for this university's goals of academic excellence. And in this first year, we've actually done quite a bit at building the institutional capacity and trying to basically think about not just uh, changing the demographics of this community, but actually changing the basic structures, processes, norms, and culture of this campus, because those have to change uh, as well. And so as part of this effort, we prepared not only the university-wide uh, DAP that was released uh, last February uh, in 2016, but we actually asked every single department, every single center, whether it's an academic department or administrative uh, department in all the centers, to develop their own diversity and inclusion action plans. And the, and the idea behind that wasn't just to get people to do a lot of extra work. The idea was the theory of change. If this time it was going to be different, from what happened in 68, or what happened in the 70s, or 92, or all the other different plans with wonderful goals. If this time it was going to be different, we thought that the theory of change had to be, it didn't have to just come from the top. Because then, you know, in two years, it might be some other crisis, and people will lose attention. It had to actually come from the bottom up, and it had to be ingrained in the basic building blocks of the university, which are the departments uh, and centers. And in the process of doing those diverse uh, departmental plans, which is really interesting because we asked every single plan, uh, department to come up with a plan, to talk to us about their goals, to try to be inclusive in the process. Some were better at this than others. Uh, and then a whole group of us read each of the plans. We made substantive comments to the plans. We sent it back to the units, asked them to revise it. And then we put all of those plans up on a website that anyone at the Brown community could look at so that we can hold each other accountable. So it's that combination of setting goals, having conversations that had never taken place in many of these different units, and then being transparent and accountable about it was the way that we think we can actually maybe this time really bring about uh, change. 
We also launched a uh, diversity and inclusion oversight board and also have a diversity dashboard, which is an online platform that actually tracks our data. And so the, just, uh, uh, was it last week? Uh, we released the annual, uh, uh, the annual report, and along with the annual report was the Diversity Inclusion Oversight Board um, evaluation of it, and then a response uh, from President Paxson and myself, and that went to everyone. So we're talking about what did we do we thought relatively well, what are really the big things that we still have to work on, and let's track that every single year so that we can actually make uh, progress. In addition to what we've been doing in terms of the Diversity and Inclusion Action Plan and implementing it in this first year, uh, we've tried to uh, bolster the support for our students, uh, establishing a dedicated first-generation uh, college and low-income center, launching an initiative for DREAMAs and uh, DACA st uh, status students, and expanding mental health resources as well as diversifying our counseling staff. And we also organized intellectual fora, uh, to make sure that we were deepening the kinds of conversations we were having on campus. Uh, uh, some of the series like How Structural Racism Works uh, that was uh, led by and pioneered by Professor Tricia Rose and also the Reaffirming University Values uh, lecture series, which actually brought together people from all over campus to, in, to engage in a series of conversations so we could educate ourselves about how structural racism works in so many different ways in this society and how we actually have to address it. And and that's what universities are supposed to do. You know, identify the problem and try to say, well, that's a really interesting problem for us to do research on and teaching on and actually do uh, action on so that we can change uh, these different things. And that's what we've been trying to do uh, over the last uh, year as well. Now, these activities were aimed to not just deepen our understanding of race and ethnicity, power and privilege, but also to equip the Brown community with the tools for effecting change every single day, one interaction at a time. And that's something else that we've been working on, which is if we're really gonna change the structures and the processes and especially the culture, it has to be not just here are these big goals and let's just work on these big goals, but how do we interact every single day as individuals? And how, how that has to change uh, so that we again, bottom up change the culture and change what we're all about. And this seems to be an important thing, not just for Brown, this seems to be an especially important thing in this time in our nation's history. Because as we were working on our own plans for increasing diversity and inclusion, uh, politics seemed to be turning, uh, the national political scene seemed to be turning in a diff very different uh, direction. Indeed, a Gallup poll from earlier this week showed that the number of Americans worrying, quote unquote, a great deal about race rela relations has spiked for the third consecutive year, reaching a record high of 42%. So people in our society are really worried about these issues. Uh, and they're worried because they don't see any leadership coming from DC. Uh, and, uh, and I don't think we're gonna see much leadership coming from the national government, at least for uh, the, the next four years. And so that's why it's up to us to actually show that leadership and show that leadership, not just as an institution, but as citizens, as students, as scholars, uh, as colleagues, as members of our community so that we can actually bring about the change from the bottom up, which is actually how we're gonna change uh, this society. And so I would say that in this first year, since the launch of our Diversity Inclusion Action Plan, uh, we've actually accomplished quite a bit, and you can read the uh, plan and, and see that. But I also want to stress that there is so much more work that we have to do. We've increased the diversity of our faculty, we've changed all sorts of different uh, pipeline programs and strengthened them, et cetera, but we have, we've only, it's just a drop in the bucket and we have so much more work to do, but that's great because that's what motivates us to sort of get up every day and work, go to work with a bounce in our step because we have something important to do and that is to not only change institutions like Brown, but to actually change this society. And I think that this is a, a really wonderful thing. Uh, uh, you know, when you have a goal that's important like that, uh, that at least uh, motivates uh, me. It's clear that universities like Brown can't be successful unless in fact we're able to bring the most talented people together from a range of backgrounds, perspectives, and lived experiences. And only by attracting a rich mix of voices, 
uh, in diverse and inclusive community, will we be able to actually achieve academic excellence and fuel this university's impact in the world? Now, this is true for Brown. I would say this is true actually for every uh, university, and I would say that this is true for our society as a whole. Again, now more than ever, these values, this commitment to diversity, inclusion, uh, an encompassing uh, uh, co a conception of what we can be as a society, a positive view of what we can be as a society is very, very important. It's this alternative narrative that's very, very important uh, right now. So our second Diversity and Inclusion Summit marks our renewed commitment to build on what we know and further advance our work on diversity and inclusion. And we're very fortunate to have on hand several diversity officers from peer institutions and leading scholars and thought leaders at the intersection of higher education and diversity and inclusion. Now this summit offers us as a university, but us as a community as well, a fresh opportunity to broaden the ways we think about diversity and inclusion and share best practices. And in doing so, we may, we may see how through rigorous research, analysis, scholarship, new teaching, new engagement, we can actually develop better practices that make us better as a university, but also make us better as a society. Now, with that as context, uh, it is my great honor to be able to introduce our keynote speaker uh, for the summit, uh, the esteemed, hist esteemed historian and president of the Andrew Mellon Foundation, Earl uh, Lewis. Before I speak about um, uh, Professor Lewis, let me just uh, note, uh, make a note of appreciation to the Mellon Foundation and all that it's done for Brown, especially in the area of inclusion and diversity. Through a number of transformational grants and programs, the Mellon Foundation has over the years helped Brown erect a vital architecture of support for diversity and inclusion. They have as well produced cohorts of graduates and scholars who are prepared to lead on diversity and inclusion, both in their careers and in their lives. Let me just give you a, a few examples. The Mellon Mays Undergraduate Fellowship Program has supported the PhD studies of over 100 fellows from underrepresented groups and others with a demonstrated interest in eradicating racial disparities since its inception in 1992. The Mellon Postdoctoral Fellowship, uh, which we have at Brown's Cogat Center for the Humanities, uh, has, has been here since 2005 and has been promoting uh, inventive interdisciplinary scholarship across cultural, geographic, and linguistic uh, boundaries. The Mellon Postdoctoral Fellowship at the Center for the Study of Slavery and Justice uh, is also uh, uh, one of the programs that were supported, supported here at Brown and is about to appoint an exceptional scholar to work uh, on race, medicine, and justice as one of the clusters in that center. Uh, and the Mellon Foundation has also been a remarkable supporter uh, for the humanities at Brown. Just last week, we received a new $1.3 million grant to support collaborative and integrative uh, uh, graduate education in the humanities. So I just want to take a note to thank uh, the Mellon Foundation and uh, its leadership for its support. With that, let me introduce our keynote uh, speaker. Uh, Earl Lewis became the sixth president of the Andrew Mellon Foundation in March 2013, following faculty appointments at the University of California at Berkeley and the University of Michigan, and serving as provost uh, at, uh, at, at Emory University. Uh, Earl is an accomplished scholar, humanities advocate, and visionary higher education administrator, uh, and is someone with immense trust in how universities prepare students to become, in his words, the artful architects of the world they seek to inhabit and pass on. He is credited with a number of bold, creative, and unprecedented uh, accomplishments that actually allowed uh, Emory University from being a really great university to really be a premier uh, university uh, that it is today. And among them was overseeing the creation of the university's first strategic plan, developing rigorous standards of excellence uh, in faculty appointments and programs, and creating com commission to study the future role of the liberal arts. In the seven books he has authored or co-edited, including most recently, are Compelling Interests, The Value of Diversity for Democracy and a Prosperous Society, Earl probes the lived experiences of people from many cultures, faiths, 
faiths and backgrounds. This diversity generates many ways of knowing and understanding things like aspiration, hard work, and identity. And now, as president of the Andrew Mellon Foundation, Earl works tirelessly to shine a light on hopeful actions at a somewhat gloomy moment in history, focusing again on the big picture. For him, the efforts of Mellon grantees, universities like Brown, scholarly institutions, museums, arts organizations, and nonprofit groups are reasons for hope in addressing the complex societal challenges of our time. So thank you, Earl, for all your wonderful work. Thank you for being here at Brown. And please, uh, everyone, join me in welcoming uh, Earl Lewis uh, to the podium. Good afternoon, everyone. I was at an event in New York City last night, and someone asked me, so um, <clears throat> how do you prepare for a talk? And I said, what do you mean? She said, well, do you actually go and ask what the room will look like and, and uh, where the chairs will be and whether it's long or wide or deep? Or, or, and I go, no. Um, I just sort of show up and, and hope uh, for the best. And I said, there have been occasions when I've gotten there, and I go, uh, I'm an old man. I need light. Uh, and uh, other times when I've arrived and I've said, you know, the script that I actually have prepared is not the appropriate script uh, for this particular event, and I have let it, uh, <clears throat> I put it aside and, and spoken. I will stick somewhat with the script today, and Rick, uh, thank you uh, for that lovely uh, introduction, and as I confessed to some earlier today, this is my first time at Brown, and I'm glad it finally happened. I've, I've been able to spend time on a number of campuses around the country, and for some reason, um, I had not made my way to this part of Providence before. And so it seems quite appropriate that it comes as you uh, really probe uh, in, through this summit uh, and ideas about national diversity, so I'm glad to be part of it. I'm a historian, it's been noted, and so I oftentimes use history to help me understand the present. And so I, what I want to do today is actually uh, start with a series of history lessons that bring us up uh, to uh, the, this moment. A decade ago, I had the great pleasure of meeting Lucille Clifton. She was visiting Emory at that time as a distinguished poet. Her visit soon, came soon after the death of my own mother. And Lucille, who had been born in DePauw, New York, near Buffalo, did a wonderful job of listening to me at that point in time, go on about the woman who had given me birth, who had done a wonderful job of raising me and my younger brother, particularly after the premature death of her husband, my father. Lucille would go on to explain that she, like me, had roots in Virginia. Four years later, on February 13, 2010, Lucille Clifton herself would die. And you're probably asking, what does Lucille Clifton, a celebrated poet, have to do with the theme of today's address, Why Diversity Matters? In word and action, she revealed the powerful beauty of the human imagination and served as continued proof that genius could be found in many places and in many forms. She grew up, as she would tell me, in a Polish neighborhood around Buffalo. As a result, she learned a few Polish words and her neighbors took to calling her the little colored Polish girl. When Lucille was born in 1936, the country struggled through the travails of a severe economic depression, what we now know as the Great Depression. Segregation or Jim Crow prevailed, de jure in the South and de facto many other places. Very few of America's leading universities would admit her of many other black kids, so she went to Howard University at age 16. In the early 1950s, Howard represented, represented the pinnacle of black intellectual life. Most of the nation's leading African-American intellectuals either taught there, hoped to teach there, or talked about teaching there. In the segregated world that was 1950s America, historically black colleges and universities such as Howard counted immensely. A college degree represented options beyond work as a day laborer or a domestic. It offered kids 
such as Lucille, the chance to dream that one day they could become poets, writers, scientists, and inventors. And true to form, years later, Lucille would become a college professor, an award-winning poet, and a sharp and incisive observer of American life and culture. And if you want just a little hint, go to YouTube and listen to Lucille read her poem, Aunt Your Mama, that iconic figure in American lore and folklore. Just read it and listen to the words and then go read the words. In the nearly half century since Lucille Clifton headed off to Washington, D.C. and to college, much, much in America changed. The judicially enforced prohibition on interracial relations changed significantly. <clears throat> More than 60 years ago, on May 17, 1954, the United States Supreme Court tackled one of the most vexing issues in history in society, the question of whether black and white kids should be allowed to attend the same schools. Since the end of the Civil War, local municipalities had effectively segregated children of different races in schoolhouses across the South and much of the nation. When the court ruled in 1896 in the Plessis decision, which had to do with seating on railroads, the separate but equal was supported by the Constitution, the legal apparatus for extending segregation had been constructed for all to use. And legislators, city council members, school board members, and a variety of politicians lined up behind the doctrine of segregation. Then the Supreme Court, with Chief Justice Earl Warren writing the majority opinion, intervened. And I'll quote for a few minutes from the language of that opinion. The court wrote, wrote, the plaintiffs contend that segregated public schools are not equal and cannot be equal and that hence they are deprived of the equal protection of the laws. Because of the obvious importance of the question presented, the court took the jurisdiction. They will go on. Today, education is perhaps the most important function of state and local governments. Compulsory school attendance laws and the great expenditures for education both demonstrate our recognition of the importance of education to our democratic society. It is required in the performance of our most basic public responsibilities, even service in the armed forces. It is the very foundation of good citizenship. Today, it is a principal instrument in awakening a child to cultural values and preparing him for later professional training and in helping him to adjust normally to his environment. In these days, it is doubtful that any child may be reasonably be expected to succeed in life if he is denied the opportunity of an education. Such an opportunity, where the state has undertaken to provide it, is a right which must be made available to all on equal terms. They will go on in that opinion. We come then to the question presented. Does, this, does segregation of children in public schools solely on the basis of race, even though the physical facilities and other tangible factors may be equal, deprive the children of the minority group of equal educational opportunities? They answered their own question, quote, we believe that it does. We conclude that in the field of public education, the doctrine of separate but equal has no place. Separate educational facilities are inherently unequal. This is 1954. A year later, the court issued its final ruling in what is known as the second Brown decision, instructing school districts to end the practice of segregation with all deliberate speed. All deliberate speed, one of my favorite collection of words uh, in American constitutional history. And why? Well, I was one of the thousands of young kids born in segregated Virginia in 1955. All deliberate speed came to mean something very particular to my generation. From the time I entered public school in 1961 until 1971, I went to state-sanctioned, racially segregated schools. That was all deliberate speed. All my classmates were black, and until I was in the eighth grade, so too were the teachers save for Mrs. Estrada, a Filipina deemed too colored to be let loose in the white schools. In the fall of 1971, my sophomore year, I entered the world of desegregation. The school broke down this way, 45% African-American, 55% white. 
School was Indian River, Indian River High School in Chesapeake, Virginia. And it was there where I gained a perspective on the Brown decision that I and most of my colleagues who write American history have failed to really underscore. Typically, this chapter is told as a case study in the search for equality. The United States was coming to terms with the importance of what the Nobel laureate Guna Myrdal labeled the American dilemma. But sitting in the classrooms in the 1971-72 academic year, a new perspective began to take shape, at least for me. Brown was about equal opportunity, for sure, but it was as much about the building of an adverse democracy as it was about the attainment of equality. You see, sitting in my classroom were the nieces and nephews of the wizards of the Ku Klux Klan. We knew this because they told us so. My 10th grade geometry teacher regaled us with stories of the good old days on the plantation, notwithstanding the fact that about half of the kids in her class were black and had a radically different perception of the days on the plantation. I tell these stories for one simple purpose. Education has been part of ground zero in a battle over whose vision of America would prevail for a long, long time. Been part of ground zero in, in the sense of whose vision of democracy also would take hold. For all of you who are students of American history, you know the end of the segregation of segregation was long, it was arduous, and at times violent. The men and women who clung to the old order that privileged them because of the accident of birth that labeled them white rather than non-white had no desire to relinquish the advantage race offered. As a result, I and my peers went to segregated schools, as I noted, until 1971, some 15 years after the Supreme Court ruled that separate and unequal was unconstitutional. So by 1971, the way we figured it, 250 years of slavery, 100 years of segregation, and now we would have our moment. Policymakers couldn't avoid the inescapable. Nearly three centuries of state-sanctioned subjugation demanded and required some kind of redress. Rather than call for reparations, governmental officials, beginning with LBJ, invoked the concept of affirmative action. Universities soon found themselves in response to student protests, societal pressures, and social understandings trying to respond and redress a national history of discrimination. I call this period race before diversity. Race before diversity. In the years between 1970 and 1978, universities expanded outreach programs to underserved communities, developed affirmative action programs to expand the number of black and brown students on campus, modified their curricular scope, introducing ethnic studies, African American studies, and women's studies programs for the first time, and pledged, and pledged to grow the numbers of students and faculty of color. Then, in 1978, a much divided Supreme Court ruled that race could be just one of several factors to weigh in admissions decisions at the nation's colleges and universities. Thus, 16 years of opposition, subterfuge, and delay came and went. The states of the South finally complied, and in less than seven years, the court took a giant step away from saying schools could remedy past histories of racial discrimination by taking race into account as a singular factor in the admissions decision. The case, which originated at the University of California, Davis, stemmed from a plan by the medical school's admissions office to ensure that 10 of the 100 seats always had black uh, seat holders. Now, although neither the University of California nor the Davis campus had a history of blocking the admissions of black students, the school reasoned that the broader history of state-sanctioned discrimination meant that, it, that if it was to ensure racial integration, then it had to do something. It had to make sure it guaranteed certain seats and certain opportunities. They concluded that this meant setting aside then those seats for the black applicants. And what amounted to a reasoned but very convoluted decision, the late Justice Harry Blackman concluded that racial quotas were unconstitutional, but that race could be used as one of several characteristics that a university could factor into an admissions decision. The court further ruled that as one of several factors, it had to advance a greater desire for diversity rather than to seek remedy 
or to seek to remedy past histories of discrimination. And so in some ways, in that period between 71 and 78, we have the period of, of race before diversity. And with the Bakke decision, we introduced, at least in the, higher American, the history of American higher education, the whole idea of diversity, the birth of the diversity framework. So the court in the Bakke decision helped to birth a diversity argument that has prevailed now for nearly 40 years. At this stage, we entered the era of what I and my colleagues at the Mellon Foundation refer to as diversity 1.0. With each passing decade and each legal challenge, higher education employed different strategies and tactics. Students represented one opportunity and faculty and staff diversity another. For one, students at the undergraduate level, bless them, turn over at a rate of about 25% per year. Whereas annual faculty and staff turnover is often in the single digits, certainly less than 10% a year. In a decade's time, with considered effort and diligent attention, one could begin to shift to student numbers. But more assiduous work was required to change the composition of the faculty and the staff, and this became more and more apparent during this period after 1978 in the 80s and the 90s, during what we refer to as diversity period 1.0. Beginning in the 1980s, selective colleges and universities, after all, racial, ethnic, class, and gender diversity is a far more pronounced problem and challenge, I would argue, uh, in the more selective the institution, began to introduce strategies to correct the seeming in, uh, imbalances. They adopted high schools with sizable numbers of students of color, trying there to uh, really compete for the best talent. They created summer bridge programs to help ease the transition from high school to college. Some pioneered the use of undergraduate research opportunity programs, discovering along the way that students in such programs fare better as measured by first year GPAs than students who had not participated in a research opportunity program in their first freshman year. These schools would then eventually go on to holistic reviews of credentials, recognizing that test scores and GPAs work best as suggestive variables alongside teacher and counselor recommendations, the strength of the curriculum, extracurricular activities, and what now scholars refer to as grit. Faculty diversification programs face greater challenges, interestingly, in that earlier period. In addition to lower annual turnover, the decentralized nature of faculty hiring could unearth a real tension between an administration's pledge to change the composition of the faculty within a specified period and the results. There were the enduring myths of the pipeline. That is, there are insufficient qualified candidates of color to compete for open positions. We've heard it for 40 years. And we certainly heard it in that period between 1978 uh, and the mid-1990s. We, we've heard this one too, or we, we live in Region X. Folks from that community won't want to live here. Or another one. I asked my friend who's the best person in the lab. And there were no folks of color that he or she recommended. Too often in this period of diversity 1.0, too often localized disciplinary-based hiring and retention practices mitigated against successfully challenging assumptions and altering the numbers. We and others have found that this was the case over, all over the United States. In addition, and here I think is most important, for too long, excellence and diversity were presented as competing and mutually exclusive options and ambitions. Along the way, universities and colleges found themselves reacting to new impulses, some inward and others outward. At the University of Michigan, for example, the first black action movement in the early 1970s led to the creation of the Center for Afri Afro-American and African Studies. At Cal Berkeley and San Francisco State, the third world student strike resulted in the birth both of ethnic studies and African-American studies programs on those campuses. And others would soon follow with their own curricular change as a response to calls for altering the relationship between the academy and its surrounding communities, especially its communities of color. But this was a process. This was truly a process. Faculty had to be hired, 
credentialed, tenured, and promoted. And at the same time, whole fields had to be born and legitimated. Take, for example, the case of Barbara Christian, my former colleague at the University of California, Berkeley. Barbara was the first black woman to earn tenure at Cal. She did so in 1978 as a, after arriving as an assistant professor in 1972. Barbara pioneered the field of black women's literary criticism with the publication of her first book, Black Women Novelists, The Development of a Tradition, 1892 to 1976. When Barbara was coming up and through tenure, she literally was asked, are there enough black women novelists to even write a book about? Just think of that moment and where the fundamental questions of your scholarship goes to and then the legitimacy of your subjects and whether or not they are worthy of themselves of exploration and study. Her work, thankfully, signaled that black women writers mattered and belonged in the canon. And the critical acclaim that later would be garnered by Toni Morrison, Alice Walker, Gloria Naylor, and others proved that black feminist criticism enriched the academy. Thus was born the symbiosis between the academic and the artist as each work to alter the makeup of the body of knowledge, as each work to make sure that what we think of as important was underscored by the work of the other, the artist writing, the academic analyzing and critiquing, one reinforcing the other. But that was also then part of a change during Diversity 1.0, where you were building fields on the ground from the ground up and trying to put together all the scaffolding. And so you have a legitimate um, expectations that people indeed should study this, people should be rewarded for their work with tenure at uh, premier institutions in the United States, and indeed these group of writers belonged in the canon. Perhaps most notably, Generation One diversity focused on the numbers. The strategy assumed that increasing the numbers of students, faculty, and staff would necessarily lead to a change in the institutional culture. Fewer schools took notice of the fact diversity's companion was inclusion, and that the interaction between diversity and inclusion approximated equity. I mean, here I usually pause and say, just think of it as an, an equation. Is diversity times and then inclusion equals equity, not diversity plus inclusion equals equity. For a school to be inclusive, it needed in the language of Paul Primanowden, president of Augsburg College in Minneapolis, uh, it needed to pivot from the hospitality framework to one of justice. He notes, is hospitality enough? Is just a fact of welcoming enough? Or is there a reason why we need to welcome, while the need to welcome demands more of us? Should we be doing more than just creating a hospitable environment? What do we mean if we're trying to create an environment that rests on the notion of justice? This first generation of students of color, as a result of all this, were active participants in the making of this history. Because if you go back and look at the literature, they stay strikes, they boycotted classes, they challenged their schools, they kept saying, you want to include us, then include us. We want more than hospitality. But more than that, they said, if you invite us in, we will change. But we also expect the institution to change. And that was sort of part of what was being unearthed and being discussed during this early period from the late 1970s into the middle of the 1990s and early 2000s. And I do say, I mean, to be honest, I think many schools are still working with uh, what it means uh, to move from uh, bringing people in and being hospitable to thinking about what it means to actually change. And this the culture uh, that Rick was referring to and how we began to deal with uh, it all. Social torment would shadow the era of, div of diversity 1.0, and it would shadow it in a lot of ways. There were always the diversity naysayers, individuals who continued to produce pseudoscientific tomes alleging intellectual superiority according to the racial color scheme, white on top, black on the bottom, 
and others arrayed along the spectrum. There were political pundits and their watchers who equated race-conscious policies with adverse discrimination, seemingly ignorant of the late NAACP leader Benjamin Hook's powerful metaphor, sports metaphor for some of you know uh, Ben Hooks' story. Uh, ben Hooks used to, during the 1990s, would uh, tell the story uh, to audiences around the country. He would say, you know, you ever looked at a track, in the 440 uh, sort of track? In the old days, they were all lined up in the same starting place, and they would run around the track. Until some point, someone came to realize that the person on the inside lane was running a shorter distance than the person on the outside lane. So what it looked like it was equal was not equitable. And then they staggered the lanes. And all of a sudden, it looks like it was no longer equal. But lo and behold, it was equitable. And what Ben was saying at that point is that we have the challenge of trying to figure out not how we build an equal society, but how do we build an equitable society? Those who were themselves experiencing this moment as lived actors in the creation of this history also spoke back. Supporters of race conscious policies responded by saying, you call me an affirmative action baby? I'm an affirmative action baby. Others in the academy would respond by saying, we can interpret and reinterpret the world. Hence was born critical race theory. And along the way, we came to understand that black or brown bodies have always been marked. If such marking comes with new opportunities, then that may be the price of paying the struggle forward. A quarter of a century after Bakke, the United States Supreme Court heard another set of cases that further altered the diversity discussion in the United States, especially among higher educational institutions. The Gruder and Gratz cases pitted the University of Michigan against white applicants to their law and undergraduate colleges. Applicants who alleged they had been denied admission solely because of the over-reliance on race by the school. Now, it's important to note here, in the end, the challengers did not question the admissibility of non-white applicants. Their lawyers actually said all the students who had been admitted to the University of Michigan through its affirmative action uh, programs were qualified. It was not whether or not they were admitting unqualified students. That was conceded. They were opposed to the use of race as a variable in the admissions equation, period. Now, this was a, I was at the University of Michigan at that time and played an active role, so I could give three lectures on this. I won't uh, tonight. Uh, <laughs> I've written a chapter in, a, in another book uh, uh, on uh, defending diversity uh, that talks about the University of Michigan cases. Let me suffice it to say here today uh, that the court in the end upheld the use of race as one variable and extended the logic of the diversity claims for benefiting then the great society, the logic that had been brought forward from the Bakke decision. But this was then followed by statewide referenda in California, Michigan, and elsewhere. Uh, with placing additional limits on the use of race. And what we have come to see is that these statewide referenda are uh, themselves are sort of important, but it goes back to the one court piece. The courts to this day still uphold the right of universities to actually build and construct a class. And that's actually very important. And that latitude of being able to build your own class is important. But coming after Gruden and Gratz, we moved in what I think of as the area uh, the era, rather, of diversity 2.0, this next period. This next generational effort is set against a backdrop of ever-increasing racial and ethnic change in America. Most demographers predict that by 2044, the United States will have a non-white majority. Now, projections show a coastal phenomenon with the majority of Americans living along the East Coast, the Gulf Coast, and the West Coast. It is also there that you see much of the racial, ethnic, religious, and other diversity. Now, parenthetically, I know this actually will put, I think, an even greater burden on colleges and universities. Because if you think of the institutions that socialize, 
uh, colleges and universities and the military play a disproportionate role in socializing 18 to 21 year olds. And if you have one lived experiences, if you live along the coast, and you have another set of lived experiences, if you live in the interior, colleges and universities will be ground zero uh, for those new encounters. And this is something not to be lost as we looked uh, to this period from now 2017 and looking ahead to 2044. But for some, this demographic Hosanna represents then, why well, do anything? In time, the numbers will take care of it all. Just wait to 2044, 2050, uh, and the America that some of us actually uh, have hoped for uh, will occur. About, I was about to use another verb, but I, I'll leave it at occur. Uh, others note that the current political moment and observed numbers should not be confused with other things like power and wealth and political control. The distribution of the population means that the interplay between diversity and inclusiveness may never produce equity. And is that not part of what we should be about? On campuses, at the same time, as we move into this period of 2.0, new questions have emerged. With greater ferocity, students of color and their allies ask what it means to be included. Some students ask for the guarantees that strike their parents' generation, ask for guarantees that strike their parents' generation as curious. They want names off of, build, off of buildings to be sure, but they want protected spaces, subjects added, and behaviors checked. Moreover, they grew up in a world far more complex than the one I grew up in, which was centered on the black and white paradigm. Concepts of intersectionality jumped from the assigned article in a class to the debates in the dorms to the ways of defining oneself in relation to the other. Administrators experiment with cluster hiring to further enhance the diversity of staff and faculty. They offer incentives such as transitional postdocs to help take an attractive candidate of color off the labor market before their value and demand is more broadly known. In a few instances, they even support additional modifications in the curriculum, hoping to counter the evolutionary change that comes when faculty are free to simply reproduce themselves intergenerationally. Some have formed consortial arrangements with either peers or unlike schools, seeking to match PhD graduates with faculty openings. All along, of course, macroeconomic forces continue to shift and reshape the contours of American higher education, as well as the American faculty. We can expect to see a more variegated sense of the faculty in the years ahead. If you look across the 4,000 institutions that make up the American higher education complex, one could expect fewer tenure lines, more clinical or faculty of, of the practice, more adjuncts and part-timers, more faculty equipped to teach in a digital format on a variety of platforms. It's a different notion of the, fact of the faculty than was true during Diversity 1.0. Remember Lucille Clifton, who grew up in and around a Polish community near Buffalo. In many ways, her world was no less complicated than the one we inhabit now. Hers, too, was a diverse world. Yet the significance of diversity has changed. Last fall, Nancy Cantor and I co-edited a volume we call Our Compelling Interests, The Value of Diversity for Democracy in a, proper, in a Prosperous Society. The volume is the first in a multi-year effort. It tries to drive home three points, and this is where I conclude. First, race, racial and ethnic diversity is not a theoretical concept. All the demographic projections point to a non-white majority by mid-century. Two, numbers are not destiny. Numbers are not destiny. Unless we carefully define what we mean by diversity and we define it in a way that moves beyond the old binaries and we do so without running away from those binaries hold on the American imagination, 
we would never be in a position to fully leverage diversity for the benefit of most. A leveraged understanding of diversity means we can explain that individuals may, as Daniel Allen offers, bond because they share similar backgrounds, perspectives, and views on the world. But if that bonding and is not always tied to bridging, the full effects of our social, racial, ethnic, religious, economic diversity will fail to be fully leveraged. Third and finally, we can define, we, we can define diversity, we can leverage diversity, but we must still come to value diversity. We have to do so for it to make a difference. Let me offer one little vignette here, I think, that sort of illustrates this point. A colleague told me a story not too long ago about a community meeting in Orange County, California. The meeting focused on investing in the schools, which translated into a tax hike. One attendee, after listening to everything, got up and asked, why should I pay for someone else's kids? I don't have any kids left at home. Why should I want to have my taxes raised? Another person turned to him and asked, do you plan to retire? The person said yes. And the other person said, then, who do you expect to buy your house? For the first time, a light bulb, I was told, went off in the first person's head. And he realized that investing in someone else's kids, someone else's kids who look different, perhaps, was actually an investment in his own future. At the end of the meeting, the man had come to value diversity differently. Lucille Clifton would undoubtedly end with a poem. I instead will end with a set of questions. How do you define diversity? How do you leverage diversity? How do you value diversity? What additional strategies and tactics would you recommend to ensure we sustain a prosperous and diverse democracy. Why? Why does diversity matter? My lecture and my comments here hopefully offer some context for answering those questions. But like any good visitor, I leave it up to you to craft the answers that make the most sense. Thank you. I'd be happy to take a few questions and, and leave in like five minutes, right? Well, <laughs> it, it took me only five minutes to get from the train station here. I just happen to be back in the city tonight, so I, I and it's a 555 train. So if, if you help watch me and I'll watch you uh, and we get this, uh, I'll, I'll play it close, but not so close that I miss my train. <laughs> so questions, anyone? Yeah. Questions, thoughts, observations? Yes. I grew up in rural Mississippi, and I worked on the uh, final uh, desegregation of the schools for the Justice Department back in 1970. The thing that I, one of the things I took away from it is the fact that there was immediate resegregation with private academies. Absolutely. Segregation academies, which still uh, suck out huge numbers of students from the public school system weakening the school system. Any thoughts on what we can do to reverse that? So, very, uh, so the observation is that uh, across the South, uh, I'm part of what I refer to as the transitional generation, right? So that group of young people who went to segregated schools for most of their lives and then were part of the largest cohort to go to desegregated schools uh, in the early 1970s. By the end of the 1970s, and certainly by the 1980s, there were Christian academies that would actually uh, pop up from Virginia all the way down to Mississippi and, and across. And those uh, Christian academies would compete for talent and uh, would, in many ways, some would argue, uh, undermine uh, the American, uh, the, the public school systems in the United States. And Gary Orfield and his colleagues at UCLA have actually been studying this now for the last 25 years uh, and have argued in a series of papers that 
ironically, American uh, public schools are more segregated today uh, than they were uh, in uh, the early 1960s. And so there are two parts to the question. Is one about just the over, the hyper segregation uh, in the United States. Some part of that is reflective of two things. Uh, one, it has to do with housing uh, patterns. And so leaving aside the Christian academies across urban space and, and cities and towns across the nation, we still live overwhelmingly in segregated communities which are mapped onto then uh, the schools and the school choices. And, and then you layer charter schools on as another form of public schools and you get a very complex tapestry there. The Christian academies then, in, as I understand it, in, in many locations, was an extension of actually that period from 1955, uh, Brown II, uh, through 1970, 71, where almost across the South, there were the mandates to desegregate. Because at least in, in my Virginia, there were whole school districts that were closed for 10, dec 10 years uh, to avoid uh, desegregating. And when they came back, uh, in a way, that short period of eight years. And so can we do anything about it? Uh, we can. <laughs> There's no magic here. It, it requires uh, th three things in my view. One, for those who are in a position to do so, uh, to raise the question of what those academies actually represent and do they serve the purposes for all. Uh, the second part is, um, what do we mean when we think about investing in public schools? I mean, because part of what has happened is that reallocation of resources uh, in many different communities. And that, I think, all of us uh, as taxpayers and citizens, we have some responsibility, sort of like the story I was telling of the man in Orange County. And we're going to pay it forward uh, so that that investment is not just an investment in that young person, but an investment in ourselves. How do we actually talk about that? And because what makes sense in Orange County may not make the same sense in some parts of Mississippi or, or in Virginia or in Georgia or someplace else. The third thing, and I think this is the, um, the greatest uh, challenge that we face, um, who benefits uh, from certain kinds of arrangements and how do we talk about who benefits? Uh, and least in my native Norfolk, Virginia, uh, when the various academies were created, uh, there was no space to talk about who benefited. Uh, and uh, it was clearly, there were two movements going on. There was something called SONS, Save Our Neighborhood Schools, uh, because that was an opposition to busing. Uh, and then there was another group that actually created the academies. Uh, and in each case, those were not singularly separate impulses. And um, we need to understand a little bit more about how those impulses originated, what happened now in the intervening 40 years, and what this will mean for the country going forward, because the demographic transition we talked about is real. Yes? Professor Lewis, thanks so much, uh, Dale, for being here at the University. Um, I love how you presented the historical context oh. of what we're in, but it's also very chilling to be able to write right now where we're not where we're, we're really not taking those lessons of the past. We're talking about that. We're talking about communities under complete assault by two communities, yeah. Muslim communities. Yeah. Any words of wisdom or advice you can share for those of us that are Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so the question is is that um, what do we do now for people who feel under assault? And how, and how do we keep people buoyed and encouraged, knowing that there's a challenge to their own personhood uh, in a lot of ways? I've been doing a lot of um, radio and television programs as a result of the publication of OCI. And someone, uh, invariably, we get to the end of it, and someone says, are you optimistic? And I said, I'm hopeful. And I said, I want to distinguish between optimism and hopefulness. I said, I'm a historian of America and with a specialization in African-American history. I, so I have a 400-year perspective on some pieces of this. And that while we live life by the second, by the minute, by the day, and by the week, what, when you take a longer view, you realize is that the arc of change is never a straight line. It's not always linear. There are periods of regression before there are members of progression. Now, I have said, usually in private and not in a public setting, 
that, but I'll say it here, and I'm probably being taped, and so this means it would be even more uh, public. Um, but I think this, is, this moment represents the last gasp of one form of dominant ideology. I mean, I actually do believe. It is not to say it won't be a tortured uh, period before we get to the other side. Um, but the legitimacy of that ideology in the context of world events uh, cannot hold. You leave the boundaries of the United States. I mean, I, I mean, I travel and all of a sudden I realize people who look like me are in the majority. And, and you're reminded of the fact that that's the world. And that um, the distance between here and Cape Town was used to be so long and took a, a three week ship ride. Now it can get you there in 14 hours on a straight flight from New York to Johannesburg, New York City, Johannesburg. And that's the person. You can be there in a second by Digital Connect. And so I actually do believe that I keep reminding our folks that there are no moments of history um, that we can point to where change became because someone was um, good hearted uh, and believed that change should happen. Change has always happened because people actually uh, took to the streets. Um, who used uh, the tools at their disposal in the battle box and elsewhere to affect the change and create the change that they want. And, and so um, I realized this season, uh, I usually say this, I have two children, 131 and 125, and, um, and this moment has politicized both of them in different ways. And one of the two, and I won't identify, was less political than the other uh, before uh, this moment. And I'm reminded that uh, for those of us who live in universities, actually facts do matter. <laughs> you are knowledge producers. And more than ever, the world needs you to produce the knowledge to contest the fake pieces uh, that would distort, distort our understanding of what's most important. So for, if you feel beleaguered and tired, that's right. It, it, that's part of this moment. Um, get some rest. Uh, uh, but the, 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 the challenge is, should not be measured by the week or the day. It should be measured by the year and the decade. We find ourselves in this moment because of decades of work on the part of some, we will get to the other side because of a decade of work on the part of others. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, there was one. There was one person, who just, and I'll be shorter. So okay. I'll try to be short too. Um, your conversation this evening, and, and I think the purpose of the forum was to discuss diversity. And I'm wondering if you think that we will get to a point where we will move beyond diversity in terms of demographics, racial, ethnicity, religion, um, gender, gender identity, to get beyond that to think in terms of more subtle forms of diversity. I say this because you know, I'm, a, I'm 54 years old, and obviously I'm an African American. I was prepared to deal with racial issues yeah. of diversity and inclusion. But the first diversity issue I encountered was when my family moved from Connecticut to Atlanta ah. in 1971, where my older sister, my older brother, and I were helping to desegregate schools. And it wasn't about going to school with black people or yeah. white people or any kind of mix. It was a cultural shock. Sure. And I think that when we landed there, the people were even more shocked that we were there. Yeah. That's one diversity issue. The other one is moving from practicing law into corporate America or government, which I have done. That's, those were huge diversity issues for me, too. So I just wanted to hear your thoughts on this. Yeah, so, so here's the, sh the short version of a very uh, complex, uh, complex question. Um, Oftentimes we think of, I'll use the iceberg metaphor. Uh, oftentimes we think of diversity as those things we see above the sea line. 
and realizing that that's how we encounter each other. That's how sometimes we structure programs and opportunities. But not realizing that actually below the surface may be the larger part of the person and the self. And so if you think of an iceberg, oftentimes what's below is actually uh, much larger than what you can see above. I think as we move through diversity 2.0 and perhaps moving to th diversity 3.0, uh, we will incorporate the iceberg metaphor uh, a little more fully and come to understand that um, what I used to refer to as uh, the multi-positional self is part of who we all are. And the multi-positional self is this, this notion I used to have that um, we're not defined by any one set of characteristics. I mean, in any given moment, something can happen that will activate something that reminds us that uh, we are connect we're from Connecticut and not Georgia. Uh, and and uh, moving into this space in 1971 comes with all kinds of uh, moments of discovery uh, that indeed uh, Georgia is not Connecticut and Connecticut is not Georgia. Uh, and, 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 but you need to be in Georgia to actually have that, that moment because if staying in Connecticut, you don't have that relational uh, sort of c uh, context to actually understand it. I think our theory and how we theorize all of this and how we understand it also will continue to evolve and develop. And then there's the challenge of actually making it apply in a school setting, in a corporate setting, in a law setting, uh, because oftentimes to this day, uh, most of us um, find it easier to count. Uh, and so as a former university official, uh, and as even as, as a president of a foundation, we have to struggle sometimes. So is diversity more than a census taking exercise? Uh, and then you go back to the old census taking, uh, and, and you sort of realize the fascinating ways in which uh, we observe the other and conclude it's something about who we think we're seeing on the other side of the threshold of the door. Uh, and we made, I, I've just been dealing with some census materials recently, and, and I go, yeah, that person was not who you think he or she was. Uh, but, uh, and you never asked in those days, you always assumed. And so part of our, the opportunity ahead of us is to move uh, then uh, from in thinking about diversity and all of its complexities. But, and I had a line in my talk, um, but knowing that the weight of history will carry some variables forward in a way that it won't carry others. Uh, and so when you walk in a room, uh, whether you may be thinking of yourself in some form or another, uh, I know for me, um, I, I, there's a rare room that I walk in, uh, certainly in the United States, where I know the other people first thing they're going, well, that's a black guy, is what it is. Uh, and, and, and the fact that I may be thinking at that point uh, that I used to play basketball uh, and, and wondering about the brackets th at this moment <laughs> or something else, uh, I'm pulled back to the reality that someone else sees me in a different way. And our understanding of ourselves in social context is always how we are perceived and how we interact with the people around us. So, thank you.